it turns out uh, this idea of fields was much more important than Faraday had realized. And it took over 150 years for us to appreciate uh, the importance of, this field, of, of these fields. So what happened in these 150 years was that there was a small revolution in science. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, we realized that the world is very, very different from uh, the common sense ideas that Newton and Galileo had handed down to us centuries before. So in the 1920s, people like Heisenberg and Schrodinger realized that uh, on the smallest scales, on the microscopic scales, the world is much more mysterious and counterintuitive than uh, we ever really uh, imagined it could be. Uh, this, of course, is, is the theory that we now know as quantum mechanics. So um, there's a lot I could, I could say about quantum mechanics. Let, let, me, let me tell you one of the punchlines of quantum mechanics. Um, one of the punchlines is that uh, energy isn't continuous. Energy in the world is always parceled up into some little discrete lump. Okay, that's actually what the word quantum means. Quantum means discrete or, or lumpy. So the real fun starts when you try and take the ideas of quantum mechanics, which say that things should be discrete, and you try to combine them with Faraday's ideas of fields, which are very much continuous, smooth objects which are waving and oscillating in, in space. So the idea of trying to combine these two uh, theories together is what we call quantum field theory. And here's uh, the implication of, of quantum field theory. Uh, the first implication is what happens for the electric and magnetic field. So Faraday taught us, and Maxwell later, that waves of the electromagnetic field are what we call light. But when you apply quantum mechanics to this, you find that these light waves aren't quite as smooth and continuous as they appeared. So if you look closely at light waves, you'll find that they're made of uh, particles. They're little particles of light, and these are particles that we call the photon. Okay? The magic of this idea is that uh, that same principle applies to every single other particle in the universe. So there is spread everywhere throughout this room something that we call the electron field. Okay? It's like a fluid that fills this room and in fact fills the entire universe. And the ripples of this electron fluid, the ripples of uh, the waves of this fluid, get tied into little bundles of energy by the rules of quantum mechanics. And those bundles of energy are what we call the particle, the electron. Okay? All the electrons that are in your body are not fundamental. All the electrons that exist in your body are waves of the same underlying field. Okay? We're all connected to each other. It's like, you know, the waves uh, on the ocean all belong to the, the same underlying ocean. Uh, the electrons in your body are the ripples of the same field as the electrons in my body. Okay? There's more than this. Uh, there's also in this room two quark fields. And the ripples of these two quark fields give rise to what we call uh, the up quark and the down quark. And the same is true for every other kind of particle in the universe. There are fields that underlie everything. And what we think of as particles aren't really particles at all. They're waves of these fields tied up into little bundles of energy. Okay? So this is the legacy of Faraday. This is where Faraday's vision of of fields has taken us. There are no particles in the world. The basic fundamental building blocks of our universe are these fluid-like substances that we call fields. All right. Okay. Um, so what I want to do in the rest of this talk is uh, tell you um, where that vision takes us. I want to tell you about you know, what it means that we're not made of particles, we're, we're made of fields. And uh, I want to tell you what we can do with that and how we can best understand the universe around us. Okay? So here's the first thing. Um, take a box and take every single thing that exists out of that box. Take all the particles out the box, all the atoms out the box. What you're left with is a pure vacuum, and this is what the vacuum looks like. So what you're looking at here is a computer simulation 
uh, using our best theory of physics. It's something called the standard model, which I'll, I'll introduce later. But it's a computer simulation of absolutely nothing. <laughs> this is empty space. Literally empty space with, with nothing in it. This is the simplest thing you could possibly imagine in the universe. And you can see it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting place to be, an empty space. You know, it's, not, it's not dull and boring. Uh, what you're looking at here is that even when the particles are taken out, the field still exists. The field is there. But what's more, the field is governed by the rules of quantum mechanics. And there's a principle in quantum mechanics, which is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says you're not allowed to sit still. And the field has to obey this. So even when there's nothing else there, the field is constantly bubbling and fluctuating in what's, quite honestly, a very complicated way. Okay? These are things that we call quantum vacuum fluctuations. But this is what nothingness looks like from the perspective of our current theories of, of physics. Okay, it's, it's worth saying that this is a computer simulation. Um, it, it looks a little bit like a cartoon, but it, it's actually quite a powerful computer simulation that it took a long time uh, uh, to do. Um, but these aren't just theoretical. These quantum fluctuations that are there in the pure vacuum are things that we can measure. Uh, there's something called the Casimir force. Uh, the Casimir force is a force between two metal plates uh, that get pushed together, basically because there's more of this stuff on the outside than on the inside. And uh, you know, these are real. These are things that we can measure, and they behave just as we would uh, predict they would from, from our theories. So this is nothing. And uh, this brings me to um, uh, the more mathematical side of, uh, of the talk, because uh, there's a challenge in this. This is the simplest thing we can imagine in the entire universe, and it's complicated. Okay. It's astonishingly complicated. And it doesn't get easier than this. You know, if you want to now understand not nothing but a single particle, well, that's much more complicated than this. And if you want to understand 10 to the 23 particles all doing something interesting, that's really, really much more complicated than this. So there's a problem in... Uh, uh, oh, it's my problem, not yours, in, in a, <laughs> addressing uh, you know, this fundamental description of the universe, which is that it's just hard. Okay, the mathematics that we use to describe quantum fields, to describe everything that we're made of in terms of quantum fields, is substantially more difficult than the maths that arises in any other area of physics or, or science. Okay, it's, it's genuinely difficult. I, I can put this in, in some perspective. Um, there's a, a list of uh, six open problems in mathematics. They're considered to be the six hardest problems in mathematics. There used to be seven, but uh, some crazy Russian guy solved uh, one of them. Um, so there, there, there's six left. Uh, you win a million bucks if you can uh, solve any one of uh, these problems. Uh, if you know a little bit of mathematics, there are things like the Riemann hypothesis or P versus NP, and they're sort of famously difficult problems. Um, this is one of those six problems. You win a million dollars if you can understand this. Okay. So, so what does it mean? It doesn't mean, can you build a big computer and just demonstrate that, uh, that these are there? It means, can you understand from first principles by solving the equations, the patterns that emerge within these quantum fluctuations? Okay. It's an extraordinarily difficult problem. You know, it's, 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 it's right in the kind of thing I do. I don't know a single person in the world who's actually working on this problem. You know, that, that's how hard it is. We don't really even know how to begin to start understanding uh, these kind of ideas in, in, in quantum field theory. Okay. Um, th this theme about um, the mathematics being, being challenging is something which, which is going to um, uh, come back later in the talk. So I'd, I'd like just to I'd take a little bit of a diversion for uh, a few minutes and give you a sense about what we can do mathematically and what we can't do mathematically. Just to sort of tell you what the state of play is in terms of our us understanding these theories called quantum field theories which, which underlie our universe. So there, there are times uh, where we understand extremely well what's going on with quantum fields. And that happens basically when these fluctuations are very calm and tame. 
when they're not wild and strong, these ones are big, but when they're, they're much more calmer, when the vacuum is much more like a mill pond than it is like a, a, a raging storm, in those cases, we really think we understand what, what we're doing. And to illustrate this, I just want to give you this, this example. Um, so this uh, number G uh, is a particular property of the electron particle. And I'll, I'll quickly explain what it is. Uh, the electron is a particle, and it turns out the electron spins. It orbits rather like the Earth orbits. And it has an axis of spin, and you can change the axis of that spin. And the way you change it is you take a magnetic field like this, and in the presence of a magnetic field, the electron will spin, the electron will stay in one place, but spin, and then the axis of spin will slowly rotate like this. It's what's called precession. And the speed at which the axis of that spin processes is dictated by this number here. Okay? So it's, it's not the most important thing in you know, the, the big picture. However, historically, this has been extremely important in the history of physics uh, because it turns out this is a number you can measure very, very accurately doing experiments. And so this number has sort of acted as a, a testing ground for us to see how well we understand the theories that underlie nature, and in particular quantum field theory. So let me tell you what you're looking at here. Uh, the first number is uh, the result of many, many decades of painstaking experiments measuring very, very precisely the, uh, uh, this feature of the electron. It's called the magnetic moment, for what it's worth. And the second number is the result of many, many decades of very tortuous calculations sitting down with a pen and paper and trying to predict from first principles, from quantum field theory, what the magnetic moment of the electron should be. And you can see it's, it's simply spectacular. I and mean, there's nothing like this anywhere else in science with an agreement between uh, the theoretical calculation and the experimental measurements. It's sort of, I think it's, it's 12 or 13 uh, significant figures. It's, it's, it's really astonishing. Any other area of science, you'll be jumping up and down for joy if you get the first two numbers right. Okay. E economics, not even that. You know, just... <laughs> but but th this is where we're at in particle physics. On a good day, when we really understand what we're doing, we're, it's, it's, it's substantially better than, than, than any other area of science. 12 significant figures. This, of course, I've shown it because this is our best result. Um, there are many other results that, that are nowhere near as good. And the difficulty comes when those quantum vacuum fluctuations start getting wilder and, and, and stronger. Uh, so let me give you an example. It should be possible for us to sit down and calculate from first principles the mass of the proton. Okay, we, we have the equations, uh, you know, everything should be there. We just you know, need to work hard and, and figure out what the mass of the proton is uh, just by doing calculations. Uh, we've been trying to do this for about 40 years now. Uh, we can get it to within an accuracy of something like 3%, okay? which, which isn't bad. You know, we're 3% there, but, but we should be much, much better. You know, we should be sort of pushing these levels of, uh, uh, of accuracy. Um, and uh, uh, the reason is, is very simple. We, you know, we've got the right equation. We're pretty sure we, you know, we're solving the right equation. It's simply that we're not smart enough to solve it. Okay? 40 years, the world's most powerful computers, lots and lots of smart people, but, but just you know, we haven't uh, managed to, to figure this out yet. Okay. There are other situations that I, I, I won't tell you about where, where we don't even get off the ground. There are some situations where, um, for very fairly subtle reasons, we're unable to use computers to help us, and uh, we simply have no idea what we're doing. Um, so it's a slightly strange situation. Uh, we have these theories of physics. Uh, they're the best theories uh, we've ever developed, as you can see by this. But at the same time, they're also the theories that we understand the least. And it's, to make progress, we sort of have this strange balancing act between you know, increasing our theoretical understanding and figuring out how to apply that to the experiments that, that we're doing. And again, it's a theme I'll come back to at the end of, uh, the end of this lecture. All right, so so far I've been, I've been talking in a little bit of generality uh, about um, you know, what we're made of. Um, and this, this is the punchline uh, for the halfway point of the talk. Um, you're all made of quantum fields, and I don't understand them. Okay. At least I don't understand them as well as I, I, I think I should. 
So what I want to do now is, is go into a little bit more specifics. I want to tell you um, exactly what quantum fields you're all made of. In fact, I'll tell you exactly what quantum fields exist in the universe, um, and the good news is there's not many of them. Uh, so I'll simply tell you all of them. Okay. So uh, we started with the periodic table. This is the new periodic table. Um, and it's much simpler, you know, it's, it's much nicer. Uh, there are the three particles that we're all made of. There's the electron and the two quarks, the up quark and the down quark. And as I've stressed, the particles aren't fundamental. What's really fundamental is the field that underlies them. And then it turns out there's a fourth particle uh, that um, I've not discussed so far. It's called the neutrino. It's not important in what we're made of, um, but it does play another important role in, uh, elsewhere in the universe. Um, these neutrinos are everywhere. You've never noticed them, but since I began this talk, something like 10 to the 14 of them have streamed through the body of each and every one of you, uh, as many coming from above from outer space as actually coming from below because they stream all the way through the Earth and then, and then keep going. They're, they're not very sociable. They, they, they don't interact. <laughs> So, so this is every, what everything is made of. These are the, the four particles um, that form the, the bedrock of, of our universe. Except then something rather strange happened. Uh, for a reason that we do not understand at all, nature has chosen to take these four particles and reproduce them twice over. So this is actually the list of all the fields that make up particles in our universe. So, so what are we looking at here? Uh, this is the electron. It turns out there are two other particles which behave in every way exactly the same as the electron, except they're heavier. We call them the muon, which has a mass of something like 200 times the electron, and the tau particle, which is 3,000 times heavier than the electron. Okay, why are they there? We have no idea at all. It's one of the mysteries of the universe. Uh, there's also uh, uh, two more neutrinos, so there are three neutrinos in total, and uh, the two quarks that we first knew about are now joined by four others that we call the strange quark and the charmed quark, and then by the, by the time we got here, we really ran out of any kind of inspiration for, for naming them. We call them the bottom quark and, and the top quark. Okay. Uh, so I, sh I should stress, we understand things very, very well going this way. We understand why they come in a group of four. We understand why they have the properties that, that they do. We don't understand it at all going this way. We don't know why there's three of these rather than two of them or 17 of them. Or that, that's, that's a mystery. But this is everything. This is everything in the universe. Uh, everything you're made of is, is these three at the top there. And it's only when you go to more exotic situations like particle colliders that we need the others on the bottom. But every single thing we've ever seen can be uh, made out of these 12 particles, 12 fields. Uh, these 12 fields interact with each other and they interact through uh, four different forces. Uh, two of these are extremely familiar, the force of gravity and the force of electromagnetism. Uh, but there's also two other forces which operate only on small scales of a nucleus. So there's something called the strong nuclear force, which holds the quarks together inside protons and neutrons. And there's something called the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for radioactive decay and, among other things, for making the sun shine. Okay. Uh, again, each of these forces is associated to a field. So Faraday taught us about the electromagnetic field, but there's a field associated to this, which is called the gluon field, and a field associated to this, which is called the W and Z boson field. There's also a field associated to gravity. And this was really Einstein's great insight uh, into the world. Uh, the field associated to gravity turns out to be space and time itself. So if you've never heard that before, that was the world's shortest introduction to general relativity. Uh, and I'm not going to say anything else about it. I'll just uh, <laughs> let you figure that one out for yourself. OK, so, so th this, is, this is the universe we live in. There are 12 fields that give matter. I'll call them matter fields, and four other fields that are the forces. And the world we live in is uh, these combination of the 16 fields all interacting together in, uh, in interesting ways. So this is what you should think of uh, the universe as, as like. It's filled with these fields, fluid-like substances. 12 matter, four forces. One of the matter fields starts to oscillate and ripple. Say the electron field starts to, to wave up and down because there's electrons there. 
that will kick off one of the other fields. It'll kick off, say, uh, the electromagnetic field, which in turn will also oscillate and ripple. There'll be light, which is emitted. So that'll oscillate and ripple. At some point, it'll start interacting with the quark field, which in turn will oscillate and ripple. And the picture we end up with is this harmonious dance between all these fields, interlocking each other, swaying, uh, moving this way and that way. Th that's the picture that we have of the fundamental laws of physics. Okay. Um, we have uh, a theory which uh, underlies all this. Uh, it is, to put it simply, um, the pinnacle of science. It's the greatest theory we've ever come up with. Uh, we've given it the most astonishingly rubbish name you've ever heard of. Uh, we call it the standard model. Okay? When you hear the name the standard model, it sounds tedious and mundane. It should really be replaced for the greatest theory in the history of human civilization. Okay? That, that's uh, that, that's uh, what we're looking at. 